What is up, Ravens Flop? Huge shout out for your support for the 410 Sports Talk. Chance and Glenn are the best in the business. They're killing it right now. They love talking Raven talk. Make sure you go subscribe to their channel. Let's go, Ravens. Big trust. Welcome in, everybody, to another episode of 410 Sports Talk. I am G I am James Haskell, along with my co-host and faithful compadre, Glenn Martin, and new friend and face on the show, Ross Jackson. Ross, how you doing, yeah, man? Welcome to the show, hey, Ross. Hey, hey, I appreciate it. Applause to you guys. Thanks so much for having me on, man. Glad to be here with you all. I appreciate you. Absolutely. And if yes. any of you guys are Saints fans or NFL fans in general, you've probably heard Ross as the host of the Lock Locked On Saints podcast and a contributor to the Saints Wire. If you haven't yet, Make sure you go check out his stuff. And Ross, of mm -hmm. course, we want to give you an opportunity to talk about that at the end where people can find you, follow you, and things like that. Um, but what we're here to talk about today, Ross, is the exciting signing of one Marcus Williams, uh, the former safety now for the New Orleans Saints, yep. current safety for the Baltimore Ravens. Mm -hmm. So let's get right into it, Glenn. What you got? Yeah, I mean, of course, we have to start where he became famous on a national standpoint, and that was the Minneapolis miracle where Stefan Diggs caught the last second touchdown. Uh, unfortunately, uh, on the receiving end of that, or the um, uh, the bad end of that, was Marcus mm -hmm. Williams, who was having a fantastic rookie year, but that was certainly marred by that final play where he gave up the, the game-winning touchdown to Stefan Diggs in his rookie season. So that was many years ago, but, I, but I'm curious as to how he was able to bounce back from that, Ross, because that is a moment where, man, I mean, yeah, you're in the NFL, but nationally, he's still relatively you know, unknown on the national scale. And then all of a sudden, he's on TV, and every clip has him coming up short and digs waltzing into the end zone. So how was he, first of all, how did he handle the situation, and how did he bounce back from it? Yeah, look, it's tough when you're in a situation to where you're part of one of the best draft classes that we have seen in recent history, right? That 2017 New Orleans Saints draft class produced both the offensive and defensive player of the year in 2017. Mm -hmm. They've all gone on to get these huge contracts, including this five-year deal for Marcus Williams. I'm so excited about for him and particularly, particularly ending up with a great team like the Baltimore Ravens. And I think he's going to be somebody that adds a ton. But in terms of how he and, – and a part of that story is how he came away – from that part of why I believe he adds so much to any team that he ends up with is because of his character. And listen, he stayed away from media for a little while, like after that, throughout the summer. And he spent his entire time that summer after the Minneapolis miracle in a gym. Everything that you saw from him was him working out, getting bigger, you know, working on tackling like a whole bunch of stuff, even though he wasn't really like a bad tackler, it was just a bad moment. And so the way that I've always said it is that I'll take 600 fantastic coverage snaps a year over one moment anytime because what happened the year after that? The Saints got bounced out of the playoffs because of something else that they couldn't control. But the year after that, the Saints got bounced from the playoffs. It happens, right? Like mm -hmm. that has just been a part of what the New Orleans Saints unfortunately have had to endure over the course of the last four or five seasons until 2021 where they just barely didn't make the playoffs. And so to hang all of that on Marcus Williams would be just kind of ridiculous. And so I know that there was a quick shift from him being a part of one of the best draft classes that we had seen in recent history to infamy. But I think that he did a really good job rewriting his script after that year. He struggled a little bit in 2018. You saw the missed tackle percentage go up. I think he was around 14% that year, but you have seen him get better and better every year since then. Yeah. No. And you know, I'm just going to say this. No surprise to me. Glenn's probably already, already knows what I'm going to say here, but I'm a graduate of the university of Utah. And here we go. Uh, here we uh, go. Uh, I, I knew here about, I knew out. about Marcus. I saw him Shout coming out. a mile away. All right. I mean, I'm super <laughs> happy for him. And of course here in Baltimore, we know about our university of Utah safeties uh, with, you know, bringing over Eric Weddle and now Marcus Williams. Yep. So you spoke to his character, uh, but what about him as a locker room presence? Like, is he a leader? What type of leader is he? Because something that's unique here, I feel like in Baltimore is, you know, you go from Ray Lewis, who is the ultimate leader, but super vocal. And then you transition through like Joe Flacco. But now you look at Lamar Jackson, who, in my opinion, I'm not in the locker room, but is more of a lead by example, like super loving, caring guy, but different, you know, vastly different in their, in their approach as a leader. So yeah. what type of uh, leader is Marcus? Um, in the locker room and presence uh, in the locker room as well. I think that he is a little bit more of a synergistic kind of guy. Like he just wants to make sure that everybody around him 
it, like that everybody is working in concert with one another, but I wouldn't call him. He hasn't really picked up the tag of a vocal leader. That was kind of Von Bell when he was first there. Then CJ Gardner Johnson and Malcolm Jenkins kind of became the vocal leaders. Now it's hard to not be the vocal leader when Malcolm Jenkins is in your same locker room. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you kind yeah. of fall into your place at that point. So I think that Marcus has been around that enough though, between Von Bell, between CJ Gardner Johnson, between Demario Davis, Cam Jordan, and, uh, and Malcolm Jenkins specifically in the secondary with Malcolm Jenkins, where I think he can develop into that role. He just, I don't know if he really got the opportunity to be that guy in new Orleans, but he is very much in tune with everything going on around him. He knows the, the, he knows what everyone's responsibilities around him are. It's what allows him to be such a reliable, deep single high safety. He has to know exactly what patterns he's looking for, what the pattern matching rules are, not just for himself, but the guys in front of him. And so I think he can develop into that. He just hasn't had to be that just yet in New Orleans. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So so all I know is, is he going to come here and start punching other safeties in the mouth like Earl Thomas did? Because <laughs> no. that's exactly what we do not need. <laughs> yeah. He's not going to cold cock our, sa- our strong safety Chuck Clark, is he? No, no, you okay, won't have okay. any of that to worry about. I think you could probably think about him as a little bit more of a uh, a Tony Jefferson type to where oh, he's going to come in, be a really good leader. He got compared to Ed Reed all the time by former New Orleans Saints quarterback Drew Brees. I think obviously those create very lofty expectations, but yeah. just in terms of like cycling him into a comparison that Baltimore uh, Ravens fans would be familiar with, I think the Tony Jefferson comparison is there in terms of his ability to play the position. Roles are a little bit different, of course, and of course, mm-hmm. Tony's role changed as you know years went on and things like that, of course. But Malcolm Jenkins very much will play the role exactly as he is coached to play the role. And there's some fantastic coaches there in Baltimore that will help him do that. And he'll be able to be one of those lead by example guys that can step in when he feels the, that it's time for him to step in in certain situations, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. And now I, I got to talk about the ball hawk. You talked about the, the ball hawk of all ball hawks, Ed Reed. And of course, right. You know, that's our guy, but I, I was looking at the numbers and he has the highest ball hawk percentage, you know, so making a play on the ball, whether it's a deflection or an interception since uh, 2017. So is that as a result of just the scheme allows him to be put in positions to make plays on the ball often, or is that number more of a direct result for his instincts and his game play? I I genuinely think it's both. Uh, And I think it has to be one because of the other, his natural instincts as a, as a player and as a safety that's able to make a play on the ball allowed Dennis Allen to utilize him in a role that maximized that skill set. And so he was utilized a ton as a deep single high safety last line of defense. You know, he's watching, you know, he's what he's doing his checks from inside out, all the things that he's supposed to be doing and then watching everything develop in front of him. We have seen him make some incredible plays because of his range and his ability to get from one side of the field to the other while the ball is in the air. If you want a couple of examples, just look at the saints and Philadelphia Eagles, most recent game, Mm -hmm. because he had Mm -hmm. a couple of plays in that game. They were absolutely insane. Not the least of which being breaking up a pass over on the sideline or a running back wheel route when he was on the opposite Mm -hmm. side of the field, when that ball came out of Jalen hurts his hand. So I think that he has the natural instincts. He has a natural, ability and skill set he has that highest ball hawk percentage since 2017 he has the second highest according to next gen stats uh incompletion percentage forced since 2017 as well and i was writing a piece over at states wire the other day trying to see exactly where he was in terms of all-time interceptions he had only been with new orleans from 2017 to 2001 he was already tied for eighth on that list wow. with 15 so i mean wow. the guy ends and and that led the team by the way during that time from 2017 on, he had the highest uh, interception percentage. He had the highest sort of share of interceptions amongst the team, even though 26 different players had interceptions during that wow. time on the team. And he had the highest raw number of 15 interceptions mm. during that time as well. And a few mm. good plays in the playoffs too, by the way. Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. So this is what I, I want to know. Cause I, I've tried, I've been trying to figure this out uh, last night since we talked about it. Generally, the Ravens get guys in these scenarios. I mean, when we signed Earl Thomas, he was well into his 30s. You know, the Ravens are known for, we talked about off air, this Von Miller signing the Buffaloes, the Buffalo <laughs> Bills just, just gave him. The Ravens are known to pick up players that age, right? Like, not that, not that not price. Not that much money. No, no, no. <laughs> not that many years, but certainly that age, right? Like yeah. 31 and up, you know, two major injuries in. Like we're kind of bargain shopping. But the thing that I think is interesting about this, and and this is really where my question comes from, is, he was available 
and the Ravens signed him. And he's only 25 years old. Is this a, a, a matter of, you know, bad, a, a bad cap situation and COVID really, you know, causing co- some constraints on the cap that, mm-hmm. that created this storm in which the Ravens were able to get a guy they normally wouldn't be able to get? Or are there any reasons that Ravens fans should be concerned as to why he was available? Because in my mind, I think a guy like this normally is not available. I genuinely think this was Marcus Williams making a decision that he felt was best for his career. I, I genuinely think that's the reason why he went to Baltimore. I, I would not be surprised if Marcus Williams simply looked at the New Orleans Saints roster as it is today and looked at the Baltimore Ravens roster as it is today and said they have a quarterback, they have a fantastic coach over there. Dennis Allen, who's taking over as the New Orleans Saints head coach, of course, has a ton of ties to Marcus Williams, but is still an unproven commodity as a head coach. I think Baltimore simply just has more proven commodities and has a better chance to win, even though it's in an ultra competitive AFC conference, it's going to be absolutely nuts next year. Mm, I still think that that is really what it came down to the saints allowing Marcus Williams to test the market came down to effectively player and organizational relationship. They did the same thing with Teron Armstead, who's yet to sign anywhere at the time that I'm saying this knock on wood. And so I think that that's really what it came down to. There is nothing of concern around injury status or character or anything like that. When it comes to Marcus Williams, at least that has that we know of. Right. And so the other thing that I would mention is that reportedly, and as we understand it, the team offered a contract very similar to what he signed that five year, uh, five year, what $70 million contract. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 14, 14 a year. The saints yeah. are reportedly offered him something akin to that last year before placing the franchise tag on him. So the fact that he took this deal with Baltimore, I think just gives more leverage to the fact that it's where he wanted to be. And it's that. Small. Right. Wow. Well, that makes me feel great because you know, there are guys that ends up, end up in scenarios Normally it's like Jacksonville, right? Like where you go mm-hmm. to retire and, and I get it. You got to chase the bag, right? You get one big paycheck. And mm-hmm. if the Jacksonville Jaguars come calling with a big paycheck, well, you know, normally you don't say no, but the fact that he's doing it for his career and not simply because, you know, it's the highest bidder or whatever the case may be I, I, is exciting for me as a Ravens fan. That would be my assumption. I think another thing that's evident in that is $14 million per year when he was yeah, expected yeah. to chase 16 to 17. Right? right. And so I think that him coming in, two to $3 million on average over the course of a contract. That's a lot of money. I mean, Hey, look, I'll mm-hmm. take two to $3 million anytime, but on a yearly basis, like that's a big chunk of change to end up coming down from. So I think that's probably mm-hmm. another thing that evidences uh, that is evident uh, in terms of him making that decision to go to Baltimore. Glenn, I got to ask you this. What do you think yeah. Eric DaCosta said to him to say, cause look, Ross, I got to tell you something. Eric DaCosta, he, he I'll tell you what he said to him. He was probably wearing a Lamar Jackson jersey when they when they met. It's probably what he did. He said, you see what I got on my back right now? <laughs> We're talking about Lamar Jackson, Action Jackson. So I, I think that that was a big part of his pitch. I mean, I'd yeah, have to man. imagine. Now, because <clears throat> what do the Saints have at quarter? Right now, they're, they're kind of in a tough spot where do they want to give the reins to Taysom Hill? Do they want to call Jameis and ask him to come? I, I could see why he would make that call. Yeah, yeah, as of right now, it's either Deshaun Watson or Jameis Winston. I mean, that's it. They're, they're, Taysom Hill's going to go back to his kind of like offensive yeah, uh, role. But the, the there's still a reality in which they don't have a choice, right? Because Jameis yeah. signed somewhere else, and then Deshaun chooses somewhere else, and then they're sort of in a situation. So uh, the uncertainty around all of it makes a lot of sense for Marcus Williams. And I think beyond Lamar Jackson being a selling point, which he absolutely is, I think – Working alongside Marlon Humphrey is a big time selling point working within that secondary. I mean, you're able to take that Baltimore Ravens defense and say, hey, Marcus, you're the missing piece. You're the piece because I know they've been looking for this rangy, deep safety oh for a while now. That's why they Dying rolled the dice for it, on Ross. Yeah, Dying it's one of the reasons it. why they rolled the dice on ET3, right? Mm-hmm. So I think that they're able to say, hey, you're the missing piece. And that has to be appealing to a guy of that skill level. Yeah. And now, do you see from a you know from an outside perspective when you look at this secondary and you see Marcus Peters, the ball hawk that he is, Marlon Humphrey, Chuck Clark, and now the, like you said, the missing piece is this one of if not the very best starting secondaries in the league. I think it's up there. I think it would be hard to argue otherwise. I mean, just those two corners alone. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, right. like there are usually a lot of teams are struggling to get an A plus at one cornerback. You don't usually get A to A plus, even B to B plus at both positions. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? And so I think that you add Marcus Williams into that 
And then you add all these other pieces around that are there, like getting Zadarius Smith back now. Like that's a huge piece that the sim the, the symbiotic relationship between pass rush and secondary now really, really takes off there. So I think that it's not just something that's about looking at the secondary. I think you have to question about whether or not that's just one of the better defenses in the league as a whole. Yeah. So yeah. the right. the other question I have to ask about Marcus is what are your expectations moving forward? Like there are some players where they come into the league, they're more polished. And you talked about him getting better throughout his rookie year and things like mm -hmm. that. But some guys, based on either age or years playing football, physical development, whatever, their runway is not as long, right? Like we talk about right. a lot of this with Adafi Owe being so young and raw coming in. We're expecting a lot more development from him as a player. But like, what are your expectations now for Marcus moving forward? Uh, like either in, in the form of accolades or you know, stats, whatever the case may be. What what do you see coming out of this contract as far as what he's able to do here in Baltimore? Yeah, look, I, I wouldn't say that he's going to come in the first year and rack up double-digit interceptions or anything like that, but I think that one of the things that you're going to see from him is that he's going to consistently force quarterbacks down their progression, which is going to open up opportunities for the pass rush. We've seen the New Orleans Saints since 2017 come in 40-plus sacks every single season, and part of that is covered sacks because the Saints don't use speed rushers. They use these guys that get into the snap clock 4.8, 3.8 seconds into in, you know after a ball is snapped because the quarterback is forced to hold the ball. So I think that when you're looking at quantifying what Marcus Williams brings to the team, it can't just be in passes, defense, pass breakups and interceptions, which I think he will find those numbers for certain. But I think that the relationship, again, that symbiotic relationship between pass rush and secondary, not only benefits the secondary, but it can benefit the pass rush. Sometimes when you have a guy like Marcus Williams, who can force a quarterback to change his mind in the midst of his progression, that opens up more opportunities to make some plays in the backfield. Mm. Wow, mm. man, you're getting, you're getting us excited here, Ross. And I know the, <laughs> the Ravens fans are feeling the same way because, you know, like a lot of fans, we saw some clips. We saw where Aaron Rodgers was forced to maybe get a ball mm -hmm. out a little quicker because he saw uh, Marcus coming over. Or like you said, forced him to check and, and go through his progressions and clearly, mm -hmm. you know, go off his number one, which was the seam, uh, the seam route because he saw Marcus coming. So, man, the excite and then the off script stuff. You mentioned that wheel route. I right. mean, come on. I mean, picking up Insane. that wheel route, that, that was absolutely incredible. Only a few safeties could even make that uh, make that play. Well, Ross, thank you so much for coming on, especially yes. on the short notice. Um, why don't you let the fans know where they can find you, where they can follow you, and what you're working on? Yeah, no problem. Look, I mean, if you want to keep up with uh, how the New Orleans Saints are missing Marcus Williams, which would tell you what the <laughs> Baltimore Ravens are getting with Marcus. I love the Marcus May signing, though. So, you know, you'll probably hear that, too. But, hey, look, you want to hear a little bit more about Marcus Williams, you can come on over to Locked on Saints. It's every Monday through Friday, wherever you get your podcast on the YouTube as well. If you're interested in all and following along at Saints Wire, saintswire.usatoday.com, and on Twitter at Ross Jackson Nola. Guys, absolute pleasure. I had a blast being here with you. Awesome. Thanks, Pre man. Appreciate it, Ross. Take care, bud.